YouTubers. Well, since Grandad has, has reached the age when he is becoming childlike again, um, that seems to be a very appropriate present, and uh, I certainly like it. And uh, I uh, like one just wanted to uh, share it with you. Um, somebody asked me, "What's it like being old?" Well. That's an impossible question to answer because being old varies from person to person. At one end of the scale, you can have people of very, uh, very old age who uh, who want to do exciting things, go bungee jumping or uh, skydiving or write a book or something. And at the other end, of course, you have very poor people who are very ill and in hospital and in great distress and. Uh, have a great um, desire to die as quickly as possible but hopefully most are in the middle um, like me who want to keep alive as long as possible and, and enjoy life as best they can but there's one thing that I'm pretty certain in all old people's mind is the fact that it will always cross their mind to think what will happen to me if I am the one who is left? And um, there again, of course, uh, that will vary, but I'm, I'm sure that is a thought that uh, many old people have, and I certainly uh, had. And in order to illustrate uh, it, I have uh, chosen to read you another bit of my writing where I have imagined that situation so so as not to waste too much time I'll um, I'll read that to you now well of course the exercise didn't ask us to do that particular thing we were to write a scene including dialogue um, but since it was done only a few years ago uh, those thoughts were in my mind I've called it it's for the best you always do that do what Rip the handbrake up like you're pulling on a ten-ton bell rope. Well, we don't want the car to roll down the hill, do we? No, I mean you'll damage the... Never mind, you wouldn't understand if I told you. Come on, let's get it over with. Jean got out, and James' sensibility was offended again as she slammed the door. He let her go into the house while he opened the boot to collect the black plastic bags. Through the gap afforded by the raised boot lid, he could see his father standing in the window. He knew he would have been there, watching for their arrival for some long time. He could see that he wore a shirt and tie and his favourite blue jumper, albeit worn and too baggy, but obviously washed and pressed. He could see the table with its clean yellow tablecloth and the tray with cups, not mugs, and a milk jug. James lowered the boot lid, smiled with satisfaction as the coy catch noiselessly locked into the well-adjusted and greased hook, then carried the bags into the house. Hello, Dad. You look tired. Are you OK? Yes, fine, thank you. Maybe a bit tired. I was up early getting things ready. Your car looks nice. I see you fitted those fog lights you told me about. Yeah, they're brilliant. Jean went into the lounge and closed the window. I'm sorry, are you cold? I opened it because I know you don't like the smell of my pipe. Shall I put the heating on? No, never mind, I'll soon get warm when I'm working. I've got the tea ready, and i got some cake. Would you like it now? Well, perhaps I'll take it through to the bedroom and drink it while I'm working. We really don't have a great deal of time. We've got friends coming round for dinner tonight, so just a cup of tea, but no cake, thank you. All right, as you wish. James, will you have some cake? It's your favourite, date and walnut. Yes, please, Dad. If you two start going on about cars and things, we'll never get anything done. Suppose I'll have to go and make a start. I'm going to do the bedroom first. James sensed Jean's mood from the noise of her shoes as she stomped along the passage and hoped that her father didn't hear her when she muttered, Take more than an open window. Just look at this. You can hardly get this drawer open for all the underwear stuffed in it. And look at the state of it. 
This is ridiculous. He can't have worn some of it for years. There's no way I'm going to give this to a charity shop. No way. Straight in the bin. Don't be silly. We've got to leave him something to wear to take with him. None of this is worth wearing. Jean held up a pair of blue briefs. They wouldn't fit a teenager, and I can't see a vest without holes. Makes me mad. He drives around in that expensive sports car, which incidentally I don't think he's safe to drive, and he won't spend a penny on a new vest. Hold that bag open. James dutifully obliged, and Jean dropped the offending garment into the bag, holding each one between thumb and forefinger as though it was contaminated nuclear waste. James curbed his desire to say anything about her attitude that might create more friction, but said that he didn't think it was right to be going through his father's things while he was still there, and wouldn't it been better to wait until he had gone? Don't be stupid. He knows he's not coming back, and there'll be plenty more to do before the house is sold. It was his own idea to go, and it's the one thing that I admire him for deciding to move to a home whilst he's still reasonably capable and not being a burden to look after when he becomes infirm is very sensible. But we'll have to make him buy some more decent clothes before he goes. I'm not having them think we don't look after him properly. Jean scooped up another armful of miscellaneous underwear and was about to stuff them into the bag. Look! What? A condom! That's disgusting, the dirty old man. Shush, he'll hear you. He's probably been there for years from the time when Mum was alive. I don't think we should be going through his personal things while he's still alive. No, you wouldn't do anything if it was left to you. Well, I don't like the idea of him going into a home. What's to say that he will become infirmed? He's content here with his familiar things around him. How can anybody be content to live in this chaos? Anyway, I've done enough for today. We must get home and get ready for the Braithwaite's. James unlocked the boot and left his wife to pack the bags in whilst he returned to, to say goodbye. Sorry that you couldn't stay longer. I've got some sausage rolls which I was going to heat up in the microwave. But thank you for having a bit of a sort out. I should have done it myself years ago. When he got back to the car, Jean was opening the driver's door. James pushed between her and the open door and got into the driver's seat, leaving Jane to walk round the car to the passenger side. He'd fastened his seat belt and started the engine and was moving off before she slammed the door. It's always the same. I go to bed resolved in my mind that today I'll make a start. I know it has to be done and Jean is correct when she says the longer you put it off the harder it will be. And if you don't get on with it in the end we will have to make the decisions. But they don't seem to understand. Which is reasonable I suppose because I don't understand myself either. Perhaps today I'll make a list of those essential things that I should take. Bed, armchair, chest of drawers, wardrobe, telly, microwave, pots and pans, and... And what? I can't see there being space for anything other than the essentials. The new place won't have the same smells, the same noises. I can identify every noise here. If the wind is in the west, there's the noise of the branches of the apple tree on the roof of the shed. If it's the other way, there's the metallic rattle of the loose cover on the outside light. And then about three in the morning, the noise of the settling of the timbers, as though the house is sh shrinking, as if it is settling down to protect itself and me. The noise of the dripping tap in the bathroom. James said he'd put a new washer in it, but he never did. I can identify the different calls from the cows in the cow shed in the field below. I know when one is calling to the bull for his attention, or the one who moans with pain as her contractions push her calf towards its delivery. 
I can walk round this house in the pitch dark, never knocking into a thing. I'm conscious of the position of the loose rug on the dining room floor, and have never slipped like they said I would. I'm aware of the vase precariously balancing on the bookcase in the passageway to the bathroom, and the feel of those furry animals on the shelf that I used to guide me to the lounge. I suppose they'd laugh if I took those. I've just remembered. I'll need cutlery, plates and mugs and washing up things and a hot water bottle and, yes, most essential, the radio. I wonder how thin the walls are there and if the neighbours will complain. The list seems to be endless, but essentials aren't things. Well, yes, of course they are things, but not my things. I mean our things. I don't have any affection for them. They don't conjure up any memories. I can't close my eyes and caress a saucepan with any feelings of love, as I can when I let my hand slide over the smooth curved arm of the chair, which has always been in the same place next to mine. There won't be any room for two chairs. Then, of course, I'll need a table to eat off. This one will be too big, I suppose. I'll have to buy a new one. Anyway, Jean has always had her eye on this one. Oh, dear, it all seems too complicated. Perhaps it would be better to leave it to them and not make a fuss. I haven't got anyone else except myself to blame. After all, it was my decision. And everyone seems to agree that it's for the best. Well, of course, that's... Uh, pure imagination since uh, I am still uh, not I'm still living in my own home and uh, haven't been put into a uh, old people's home yet and so it is uh, pure imagination although the description of, uh, of my house uh, is uh, pretty accurate however um, I'll leave it there hope to see you again very soon until then, goodbye.